Cool. So, good afternoon, everyone. Um, by way of introduction, my name is Zen, and my project is the recommendation on Optimal Medical Linear Accelerator, or LINAC, commissioning and QA, gantry and collimator angle selection, and frequency based on LINAC-specific radiation isocenter variability. I was supervised by Dr. Peshman Roshan Fasad and Hans Lingard Riss, and um, big thanks to them, especially to Peshman um, for for his patience and um, how much he's guided me throughout all this. And I've learned quite a lot of interesting novel techniques because of him. So thank you for sharing that those techniques with me. All right, let's get into it. All right, so this is the motivation for my project. So due to modern advancements in technology, the mechanical stability of the Linux these days um, are beyond submillimeter levels. And that's why we have the advent of new stereotactic radio surgery techniques, such as SRS, um, which is stereotactic radio surgery, and SABER, which is stereotactic ablative radiation therapy, or SBRT. Those are interchangeable. So these stereotactic techniques, what they have in common is that they're highly precise and focused beams. Usually they employ very high doses into very small volumes in minimal fractions. And so as we know, for high doses, it's dangerous if those spill over into healthy tissue. So we want to try and keep them as conformal as possible. As a, a bit of background about for SRS and SABER. So for SRS, it's usually used for intracranial lesions, whereas for SABER, it's for extracranial and for other body parts as well. Whereas for SRS, it's predominantly only used for the brain. And so I have a table here that just contrasts both of them. Uh, usually the field sizes in SRS are much smaller than that of SABER, and SABER has multiple arcs and usually has more fractions compared to SRS. Um, but the main gist is that they both have very strict tolerances in as to how much they can deviate during uh, patient treatment. And this is what motivates this project. So first off, let us understand what the radiation ice center is, because I think this is a confusing point for many. Um, so we have the official definition, where it's the intersection of the central axis of planar and non-planar radiation beams. So basically, as your collimator and your gantry is rotating, and your couch might rotate as well, all these combinations of beams would give you your radiation isocenter in the middle. And that should be a single point in theory, but because of mechanical uh, variations and no machine is perfect. It's a sphere in, in practice. The size of this radiation isocenter is the smallest circle that inscribes all the central axis. And usually when we talk about radiation isocenter, we're talking actually about the positional coincidence between the radiation isocenter and the mechanical isocenter which is then used as a primary reference location for any external beam radiation therapy or EBRT. So I got this image here from uh, Luke Slama's um, paper, and it just shows how the coincidence of your gantry axis, your collimator axis, and your couch axis gives you your mechanical isocenter. And in practice, that should also be where your radiation isocenter is. But as we know, that's not the case. Some factors affecting the radiation isocenter would be mechanical variations within the LINAC. So no two LINACs were made the same. You have your X-ray target and beam focal spot instabilities, gantry sag due to gravity, MLC carriage movements, again, due to gravity or the momentum of the actual LINAC uh, rotating, damage or defects or repairs or changes to the treatment head or to the beam components. So how do we measure the radiation isocenter? It used to be done through film. Now it's usually done through EPID. And we have two methods, the Winston-Lutz test and the Starshot test. So the Winston-Lutz test, um, if I could draw your attention to the image on the left, bottom left, it's a technique for ascertaining the alignment and positional coincidence for both the radiation and mechanical isocenters. It basically works by placing a steel ball within a phantom and after exposing it to radiation, 
the film or it film is not used now anymore um, we have modern equivalents the discrepancies of the shadows being casted onto the detector is then um, analyzed and any shifts would then be corrected so just to take note from now on when i am mentioning uh, radiation isocenter variability i'm talking about the size of the radiation isocenter and if we're talking about coincidence, we're talking about the midpoint of the circle for both the mechanical isocenter and the radiation isocenter. So on the bottom right here, this is a, a typical star shot test where for A and C, you have different uh, fields, star shot fields. And then for B and D, you have the central axes being extracted from those and then the largest or smallest circle that inscribes every single uh, line is then found. So a quick note of why we have to differentiate between positional coincidence and the actual variability is because if we take image B as an example and I've extrapolated over here on to a corrected Winston Lutz test, we can see that the green circle is within tolerance because if the co positional coincidence is taken um, at that point, we have variability that still lives within the one millimeter tolerance that is required for SRS and Sabre. Whereas if we look at the red circle, even though um, the system might have thought that it's correct at the posi positional coincidence, the variability of the radiation isocenter size itself um, may put that machine out of tolerance for any SRS or Sabre treatments. So that's something that we need to look out for. So why is this important as well? So again, because we're treating very, very small lesions with very high doses, we need to be very precise. And on the image here on the left, we can see the GTV, the CTV, the PTV, and the treatment volume. And finally, the irradiated volume. We want to keep these as conformal as possible. Um, to reduce the doses to the healthy tissue and increase the dose, um, the killing dose to the lesion itself. And so we want to increase the tumor control probability and reduce non-tissue complications by effectively increasing that therapeutic range, which is the ultimate goal of radiotherapy. So this is just a quick map of what I'll be going through. Um, so we're going to be talking about the image extraction and how I detected the edges, um, how I detected scan directions, how I achieved subpixel accuracy, and then from there how that was extrapolated to the central axis for the beams, and then using statistical models to then extract out the largest radiation isocenter size. And from there, I'm going to go through some analysis, and then I'm going to conclude. So firstly. So just a bit on reproducibility and repeatability, intra and interday measurements were taken across all the Linux for each gantry and collimator angle. So this was to ensure the images acquired as part of the study were repeatable and reproducible. And the following table below are images, the number of images taken across the eight Linux. So all acquisitions were taken at 13 different gantry and collimator angles. So if they were taken in steps of 30 degrees. So for one entire collimator arc, you would have one gantry angle and so on and so forth. So that gives 169 images per set of acquisition. So as you can see, our total images go up to the count of roughly 22 to 23,000. And this is just a list of the Linux that we used. Um, note that only Linux 3, 7, and 8 have 6MV triple F beams um, being sampled. The rest of them just have 6 MV and 18 MV flattening filter beams. Moving on. So this is the algorithm that I used to extract the radiation isocenter position and size. And all of this is, was coded in Python. So for every image in every gantry angle, I would first read the DICOM image using PyDICOM. So if I draw your attention to the image on the right, um, the black and white image would be the extracted DICOM image with the load epit function, which basically gives off a pixel offset to basically enhance the edges. 
and this pixel offset is available for Electa, Varian, and Siemens. Um, so this code that I wrote can effectively handle um, data from all three manufacturers, which is great. And when I extracted the data, a median filter is applied for edge preserving noise reduction. Um, I used a median filter and not a canny, uh, not not a Gaussian filter because the Gaussian smooths and it destroys edges. And usually for um, these DICOM images, um, I just want to remove salt and pepper noise. So now I apply the canny function using OpenCV in Python to detect all the edge edges, um, and for each row or each column, depending on the angle of the image itself, I've paired up the indexes just so that when I do scan the images later on, every single row that I scan or every single column that I scan will guarantee to only have a pair of points, which makes things a lot simpler. Next, I apply scan direction to the edge positions. So if we look at the third image from the right, the ones with the two red lines and the scanning direction. So that's basically how the scan direction works. If the length is greater than the width of the image, I'm going to scan it vertically. And if the length is less than the width, I'm going to scan it horizontally. And this makes finding out the angles themselves later on much easier. So once I've scanned um, the images, I'll be able to index all the pixel positions and then apply a cubic regression by drawing a profile, again, um, represented by that scanning black line. Um, I'm going to draw a profile across every row or every column, depending on the scan direction. And I'm going to take the closest pixel value that's closest to the 50% intensity value. And why, do, why did I take the 50% intensity instead of any arbitrary value? It's because if we look at the image at the bottom, if I did not take the 50%, what could happen is that the pixel point that I chose for the canny edge detector, because it works based off of gradients, that edge position could actually be at the top of the shoulder or at the bottom of the shoulder on the left and right edge of the profile. So taking the point closest to 50% and then extrapolating from there would result in much more accurate analyses. So two points above and one point below for both the left and right side were taken to fit a cubic curve. And then the actual 50% of intensity normalized um, would then be extracted from that cubic function and then indexed again as a pair left and right. And then a linear regression is then applied to those pair of points. By, base, by averaging the points, I get to find the mean value. And then from there, a linear regression is used um, to basically fit the central axes, which you can see on the fourth image from the right. And then from there, I can find the collimator angle, which is just using the out tangent function, and then using the binomial function to find all the possible sets of combinations of three, because we just need three central axes to make a triangle and to find the inscribed circle. And then we apply Heron's function to find both the size and the position of the radiation isocenter, and all this gets um, outputted. So something to note, only 70% of the image is taken uh, in field. Um, that's done so that the initial, the initial any additional edge noises and the ball bearing shadows will be removed and this threshold is automated so you can increase or decrease it accordingly. So next would be the binomial coefficients. It's basically n factorial over k factorial times n minus k factorial and rep represents the count of combinations that can be generated when selecting k objects from a larger set of n objects and without order, without care for order. So a set of 13 star shot image will give 286 unique combinations, which you can see on the left. And then the second image from the left would be one particular combination. And then the image on the right would be a simulated star shot pattern with your largest radiation isocenter in green. And then now to apply Heron's formula, um, I do have the derivation of this in my thesis, so if anyone's interested, they can have a look at it. Um, but basically, we apply the in-center position formula and 
Heron's formula to find both the size and the position of the inscribed in circle and the radius. And from there, the output file gets uh, gets saved. And then now cleaning the data, I end up with the file, the energy, gantry angle, three different collimator angles that make up that particular radius, the radius value, the filter type, and the circle positions in X and Y. And from here, we'll be doing the analytics. So this is the summary of the mean radiuses and the corresponding standard deviation values for each gantry angle and the aggregate for all the next one to eight combined. So if I draw your attention to the aggregate values for the six MV double F beam, we have 0 0.58 millimeters with a standard deviation of 0 0.02, uh, 0 0.02. For the 6MV triple F, we have 0 0.66 and 0 0.03. 18MV uh, double F, we have 0 0.58 and 0 0.02. Over on the right, you can see the distributions of both the radiuses and the radiuses as uh, against the gantry angle to see how each gantry angle actually fared. And this is basically a graphic or visual representation of the graph of the table on the left. So a question that we have to ask ourselves now is, what can we draw from this? What meaningful conclusion can we draw from this? So from here, we have to do some statistics. Uh, we have the Shapiro-Wilk test, which serves as, the, as a tool to check if a data set adheres to a normal distribution. We have the Kruskal-Wallis test, which is a non-parametric statistical test um, designed to evaluate if there are significant differences among three or more independent groups. Uh, if your test were to be a normal distribution, then you would use an, an ANOVA. And then Dunn's test is just a second non-parametric test to check which group is actually significantly different after doing your Kruskal Wallace. So for your Shapiro-Wilk test, we can see that all the p-values for all three energies were less than 0 0.05, and we reject the null hypothesis being that the data set is normally distributed, and we can see it's quite obvious that it's not normally distributed. The crystal wallace test, uh, again, for table three, we can see that the p-value is way less than 0 0.05, and this suggests that there is a significant difference between two or more of the groups, but we do not know which group it is. So we end up doing the Dunn's test to find out which combination actually produced the greatest differences. If the value equals to one, there's no significant difference. Um, and if we look in the table below, we can see that each energy grouped with itself gives a value of one, which makes sense because the same data set compared to itself will have no significant difference. We can see that the significant difference comes from your 6MV double F against the 6MV triple F and the 6MV triple F against the 18MV double F. This suggests that double F beams are, aren't statistically different to each other regardless of energy. Um, definitely more experiments will have to take place to confirm this, but that's what it suggests. It suggests that what we have to be concerned about is triple F beams, and that's something important because SRS and Sabre is conducted with triple F beams. So that's something to watch out for. And then for this, we can see that the gantry angle and the mean radius are plotted against each other. And the polar plots on the right are basically the same plot that you can see on the left, but just in a polar plot. And we can see that across all the different gantry angles, the radiation isocenter sizes are quite constant and they're all within one millimeter. But however, please note that the, these values are the radiation isocenter variability, not the positional coincidence. So for the Winston Lutz test, it's been written in the paper that the radiation and mechanical isocenters can be uh, reached and adjusted to within 0 0.2 millimeters using the Winston Lutz method. However, Given the results of our studies, um, if I go back to this plot, we can see that for the 6MV triple F beam, we have a mean radius of 0 0.66, which suggests that if there is any positional, co uh, positional co coincidence deviation greater than a value of 0 0.34 millimeters, 
then that would cause a failure in the actual allowable tolerance for SRS and SABER, which is one millimeter. And this, moving on, we're now talking about the collimator. So on the left, we have the summary of all the probabilities for each collimator and angle contribution um, for all the gantry angle measurements. And how this was done was basically taking all the combinations of the collimator angles that resulted in the largest radiation isocenter, and then normalizing those values and plotting to see which ones appear the most. And we take that as the probability that a particular collimator angle would affect um, your radiation, would have the most effect on your radiation isocenter size. And that's important because of um, new VMAT techniques and your stereotactic techniques, which use your MLC quite a lot. And there's a lot of collimator rotations and gantry rotations as well. So on the right, um, what I can see or what I've realized is that it looks like it's a modulus function. Uh, combination between sine and cosine. Uh, more work needs to be done for this, um, but it's quite exciting to think that it could definitely be modeled. Um, a caveat for this would be current uh, TG198 um, says that for annual QA for positional coincidence and for collimator uh, QA, uh, only four cardinal angles with opposing collimator selections are required. And for cardinal angles for 0 degrees, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, and 270 degrees, we can see that it actually coincides with all the troughs, like either the local or uh, global minimums, which is not great. So if we were to extrapolate it, uh, it would suggest that the maximums would occur roughly in between roughly at about 45 degrees and every 90 degrees thereafter because that's the period of the curve. Um, so this is something to consider as well um, because these aren't currently the recommendations. Um, it is part of this study to bring awareness to all this. And I believe that this could be future work as well to actually come up with the function um, and to see if it holds true for larger data sets and also for different manufacturers. This would be out of the scope of my study, but just due to the virtue of how the data was extracted, I thought it'd be something interesting to share. So this actually shows the epid and gantry sag effects, which some of the previous students and Pejman actually characterized. And even though the gantry sag and correction factors were not part of this study, um, we can see that the greatest sag occurs at 180 degrees for Electa Linux, and this suggests that the supporting arm isn't as sturdy as we thought it was. And then finally, for the discussion and conclusion, uh, discussion, I've already gone through all that. So for the conclusion, number one, in addition to the current standard commissioning and quality assurance protocols outlined in TG142 and 198, it's advisable to introduce additional protocols for measuring radiation isocenter variability, not coincidence. And these supplementary protocols should account for the increased size of the deviation of the radiation isocenter due to any mechanical variations that may arise within each LINAC during treatment at various gantry and collimator angles. Number two, following current recommendations in TG198, the assessment of the radiation isocentricity for each axis is commonly conducted using a star shot. And this only check, this checks for the alignment of the radiation and mechanical isocenters. Um, specifically, the intersection of the lines should fall within tolerance circles. But again, this does not take into account the variability. So it's my advice out of this study and recommend, it's my recommendation, sorry, to measure the radiation isocenter variability at different gantry and collimator angles, typically in 30 degree increments, and the resulting mean radiation isocenter variability should be added to the positional de deviation measured by the Winston Lutz test, and then incorporated into the TPS to provide a more accurate representation of the actual movement and deviation of the radiation isocenter from the mechanical isocenter, which is very important, which I have to say again, uh, the Tolerance levels for Sabre and 
SRs and other stereotactic techniques is set at one millimeter. But again, for any other technique, the more conformal your beam, the better. So this actually applies to all techniques, but specifically more importantly for stereotactic techniques. So in terms of future work, we could do a comparison with variant Linux because all these data sets were from Elector and we can check to see how different manufacturers perform. And that could potentially maybe aid in future purchasing uh, decisions. Secondly, uh, diffusion based models for denoising. So there has been quite a lot of work in terms of artificial image generation and denoising based on diffusion based models and machine learning. So I believe that instead of manually applying a median filter or any other uh, smoothing or noise reduction filter, diffusion based models could potentially be automated into the system so that you have enhanced images. Which leads on to the second point. You have we could use diffusion models for image enhancement and increased angular resolution. So to acquire all these images, it took a very long time. And we have to note that these were only in 30 degree increments. If we were to go a bit crazy and want to model the entire arc at each control point, then that would take an insanely long time. And a way around that would be to be able to and uh, lower the monitor units, which would increase the which would decrease the amount of time it takes to get get the images, and then the images could be enhanced by a trained diffusion model, and this gives us increased angular resolution, so we know exactly what's happening at every single control point in terms of its sag. And building on further from that, even though now it's still in, in its infancy, uh, diffusion models for dosimetry, since we have image enhancements and denoising. I believe that's potentially something that would be very favorable. And then finally, something more clinical, we can incorporate what we've learned here today into a TPS or stereotactic or conventional VMAT treatments. We could start off by making plans first and then modeling how much of a deviation it actually is when put into a TPS um, plan. And yes, thanks for listening. Any questions? Really great work there, Zen. Fantastic presentation. Thank you for that. Thank um, you. Looks like Pejman or Mashid have a question. Yes, thank you, um, Zen. Um, I have a question about um, how your findings compare to electors recommended um, angles. Um, do you know what they recommend for commissioning of the machine? Yep. Yeah. So to the best of my knowledge, there's actually no recommended angles for commissioning. Uh, what this Starshot pattern is, is that um, it's usually taken at cardinal angles and if so, and at best, it's taken at every 30 degree intervals, um, but most of them refer to TG198 and 142. And in that, it just recommends a commissioning or an annual QA um, interval of 30 to 45 degrees. Um, OK, I'm sure Varian has some recommendations for the angles. That's why I asked. Uh, maybe Electro has. OK, so, so you have considered that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks, Machine. Peshman, do you have a question? No, oh, good. Okay. <laughs> Does do we have any other questions for Zen? Looks like you uh, sufficiently answered all the questions there. Zen, your presentation was just that clear. Cool. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, all right. Um, if there's no other questions, we'll uh, move on to the next presenter. Thanks again, Zen, for the great presentation. Thanks, Jake.